Well, fiat's root word in Latin itself actually means by decree. And so we now have a money system that is by decree and that there's no actual value that supports the US dollar, the euro, the yen, any global currency at this point in time. It is literally the decree of government saying you must accept this at the value that we declare it because we have declared it. And that's part of kind of a, a much larger paradigm that's been implemented on humanity as a whole that like we're just supposed to obey as opposed to actually question why does this thing have value? And I think that's really what Bitcoin has introduced to the world is that now that we have this other currency that we can look at that actually has its basis in real electrical and computational power, that there's an ability to actually say, well, what, what is value and why should we value it? Should we value it because the government has decreed it to have value? Or should we recognize the value of something because of the way that we actually understand it to have value for our own subjective choice? By appropriating the means of exchange from being a, a subjective choice of whatever I find the most valuable to this thing that's been decreed to us, that's really allowed for an overtaking of pretty much all economic aspects of human life and appropriating that into the life of government and allowing for them to be a middleman to all parts of economic life which, in my opinion, has fundamentally modified how we are as human beings and the ability for us to make decisions on our own. The current monetary system is based upon what's called modern monetary theory, which was invented by John Maynard Keynes. And he had this, frankly, a very brilliant idea where he was like, look, government intervention in markets can actually be a really positive thing if we actually change the money supply and distribute that money to people that are creating positive goods for society. The problem is, however, that money actually gets distributed to those that are closest to the political class that have alliances with them, uh, which in a very disgusting way, that those usually tend to be warmongering individuals that actually have their money directly in industries of war, violence, and barbarism. And so because of the development of the fiat system and the way that the political class seeks to enrich themselves first and foremost, the money that gets recreated and distributed into the system, it's always going to be politically motivated to some degree. And so most recently, we saw the acceleration of this with COVID, where we were told we need to have things in America like Operation Warp Speed, where we printed out, we just created a trillion new dollars that were part of the monetary system that never existed before. And we gave that to some of the richest corporations and individuals in America under the auspicions that this distribution would help. As we've witnessed four years later, we're seeing that that has actually caused for rampant inflation and suffering of just general people. And this has been the sort of setup of the entire monetary system is while we're told it's on the basis of serving the people and being able to help redistribute wealth in a meaningful way, it actually concentrates wealth in the political class more than ever. And today we're seeing the very real suffering that people have under this inflationary agenda, where instead of money actually having its real basis and value in a commodity such as gold or silver, it has its basis in the authoritarian decree of governments. And that has created for a very dangerous system where most people don't have any ability to acquire wealth in a meaningful way. This idea of fiat money, because there is no actual value behind it, that's transposed onto people to have a belief that there is no real value in the world on a whole. And that allows for them to engage in this nihilistic form of consumerism where people say, well, why shouldn't I engage in any behavior that I can to make money irregardless? Because there's no point or meaning or purpose to anything. So what does it matter if I make money in ways that might not be the most moral or ethical? And it's very sad because you can actually see the very real banality that a lot of people engage within and that there is a very deep moral wounding that's happening because instead of them truly stopping to think about whether or not money should have value or not, they just take on the perspective that society has given them of that, hey, you just got to get as much money as you can and get as rich as possible at whatever means necessary. When the truth is, is that actually damages society more on a whole and passes that damage on to the next generation. So that this is one of the reasons why we're seeing such a collapse in societal values today is it's not because that people are actually evil or wicked, but that we were taught by our fathers and their fathers before them that, hey, you just gotta make as much money as possible. And that's the most meaningful thing in society. And it turns out that if that's the way that we do direct ourselves just through rampant consumerism, it leaves us totally hollow inside in a way that we can't actually heal unless we try to heal society on a greater level as well, which I think we're 
trying to do with Bitcoin and other forms of self-sovereignty. Is It's really about engaging in a new form of communal self-care where we say, I love and care about you enough that I want you to have a money of value and I want you to have the self-sovereignty to make your own choices for yourself that I, I can't direct for you. First and foremost, sovereignty is about the real ability to have choice around something and the self-empowerment and freedom of the, the infinite possibilities that are involved with really being able to choose. And so I think in contemporary modern society, most of us don't actually have any real true degrees of sovereignty. And that's why most people are locked into a fiat nine to five job that they're forced to live somewhere in order to be subservient to that job. And while there's all these sort of rules and regulations that really govern the fundamental forms of life that most of us have because we don't have sovereignty. Because if we did have sovereignty, there would be a true freedom of choice that we could have about the kind of money we use, the kind of education we have, the kind of communities we build, the kind of governments we have. But we're truly actually locked into something uh, much more pernicious that doesn't actually involve freedom. There might be a few choices, but that doesn't involve the whole plethora of possibilities of you know, the truth that real choice is, which is sort of the infinite possibilities that could be if we were actually free. People through their fear and because of allowing for fear itself to govern them, they've given over their sovereignty to different governments that they believe have safety and security at the forefront of their concerns and worries about us. But there's a real lack of foresight and understanding that through allowing for fear to become the primary mechanism of what drives us, that actually robs us of real sovereignty. Because fear, fear shouldn't become sort of the base nature of why we choose to do things, you know? And, and it's really important to understand that what courage is, is to be afraid anyways, but to not allow for that to influence our choices. So I think over time, particularly since the fiat standard was enabled kind of in the interwar period, there's been a very slow slipping of power, building of regulations, more rules that have really restricted the ability for man to truly be sovereign and make choices and decisions for himself. And then I think with the advent of the internet, that accelerated the process uh, in a very dramatic way today where we essentially have a global panopticon that's working in lockstep and tandem, whether it's you know the American surveillance, Chinese surveillance, British, whatever have you. It's all based upon eliminating the idea of privacy and the ability for people to have a choice of whether or not they get to participate in the system. In an interesting turn of events that Bitcoin seems to constantly do, in the production of creating what is called a blockchain, Bitcoin introduced the idea and ability for governments to make something called a central bank digital currency, which is essentially, it's a version of Bitcoin, but instead of it having proof of work, it has a proof of stake system that's based on, again, government decree. And what's unique and different about uh, central bank digital currency from uh, both other blockchains and uh, from Bitcoin on a whole is that, and also the fiat system in general, is this allows for them to have a much greater degree of surveillance over everyone in all economic transactions everywhere in life at all points in time. So the very idea of financial privacy in a central bank digital currency system can't even exist. And what becomes extra problematic is as we saw in COVID, if it turns out that you have different feelings from the government about how dangerous, say, a pandemic is, the government can now say, oh, we see you're still engaging in business operations. Not only are we going to shut down your business operations, but we're going to seize all of your funds in that, and we're not going to allow for you to spend any of your money. Which today, that can still happen with the banking system, but at least there's a third party inter intermediary with the banks. Whereas with a central bank digital currency, that's going to happen directly, and I also think one of the real dangers in America is even though we have politicians say we won't have a central bank digital currency, they essentially want to allow for private versions of a central digital bank currency, such as USDC, to be able to implement that agenda for them. And very similar to how banks will censor people today for things that the government don't like, we'll have the same thing play out on that side of the spectrum. So the best thing about Bitcoin is nobody actually controls it. That there, there isn't this authoritarian system at the bottom that is by decree and that Bitcoin uses very real computational energy and very real electricity in order to create what's known as the block subsidy, which is how all Bitcoins get created. And so every single Bitcoin, we can actually trace back to amount of computational electrical energy that it utilizes to secure and proof the system to make sure that no one can steal from anybody else. 
So this is a, a sophisticated and robust system that ensures and allows that if I spend Bitcoin to your account, once it has been mined and included in a block, there's no way for me to reverse that transaction or take the Bitcoin back. In addition to the fact that there's no way for the larger system of Bitcoin on a whole to take that Bitcoin from you. So it allows for a new sense of true self-sovereignty around a monetary system. And I think the real benefit that it has over, say, a system like gold, which also has self-sovereignty, is that gold needs to actually be physically custodied. You have to have an actual piece of gold for it to operate. Whereas with Bitcoin, all that you need to do is memorize your 12 words that can create your private key, and you can access your Bitcoin anywhere in the world at any point in time. And nobody even knows how much Bitcoin you might actually have. And so to me, this opens humanity up to a totally new form of sovereignty through the internet directly that we've never seen before. And I believe it has a, a radical new form of empowerment that most people can access through their understanding of cryptography in the very real form of self-sovereignty that that creates in the digital age. Cryptography allows for any individual human being to have the access to the same power and privacy that militaries have had access to for the last 70 years that is created fundamentally through mathematics. And it's by the very idea of that when you take a very, very, very large number and you, you're trying to just randomly find that, it turns out that it, it's almost impossible for you to find a number that is something like 12 to the 256 power because of how difficult it is to just randomly find that. And so based off of that ability, we have, we have the capacity in order to use cryptography to make not only our information private, but also our wealth itself private. And to me, like, that's one of the most important things in a world where we have governments that want to seek to surveil sort of everything at all times for all reasons, that we can actually reclaim that power and say, no, you, you don't have a right to surveil my wealth. You don't have a right to surveil my digital and social media. You don't have a right to actually look into the private affairs of my life. And I'm going to choose to protect myself using cryptography in order to encrypt my information and protect myself. Through the self-sovereignty of money and wealth, this has allowed for Bitcoiners to see that sovereignty is actually a much larger idea that wealth is just one aspect of it. So we've seen a lot of Bitcoiners take sovereignty over say their health by choosing you know, not to vaccinate their children or themselves with COVID or other means, by people choosing to grow their own food and grow their own meat and choose to utilize systems that are outside of the contemporary food system, but also sovereignty over, say, education and choosing to pull their kids out of government-funded schools and actually teach them on their own. And I think what it really teaches overall is that when we engage in the greatest forms of self-care for ourselves and our family, it actually becomes a methodology of self-sovereignty because the only way that you can truly care for yourself is if you take the full responsibility to say, I need to make a life that ensures that no one else can have power over me. Anarchy is the idea that we should have no gods and no masters, that all human beings can engage in consensual, nonviolent, contractual relationships with one another, and that that can be the basis of society on a whole. And it's very important to understand that the anti-statism that's involved with anarchism, it says, look, it's not about there being violence and chaos and uh, everything just kind of being willy-nilly on fire. It's much more about saying, instead of other individuals having a right to violence over me and other people in society, that no one should ever have a right to violence over anyone else for any reason. And that together by us choosing to make consensual, nonviolent agreements with each other, we can actually create new methods of organizing ourselves. And I believe that the internet empowers that in a much greater and meaningful way than we've ever seen in human history. And I really hope that we see a renewal of anarchist principles and people organizing around the very philosophical praxis that nonviolence should be a non-negotiable starter for all economic, social relationships, and ultimately the basis of politics itself. Even though we've been told that the world doesn't have meaning or purpose or spirituality or deeper things, that it turns out through the pursuit of truth itself, we can actually rediscover in ourselves, in our communities, and in our friends, a very real deep sense of spirituality that in whatever context you want to hold it, 
it gives us a greater meaning to actually strive together to create a new and different world, one that doesn't involve the sort of pointlessness of consumerism that we've all been absorbed by. And I think with that sort of hope, there is a real ability for us to change the future, both for ourselves, for our children, and for all of posterity to come.